This is the Story Punks podcast, a show where we talk about all the punks. So steampunk, diesel punk, cyberpunk, and all the other punks. I'm your host, Cindy Grigg. This is episode 29. I'm kind of faltering here as I'm announcing this show because this is just one of those surreal moments. I felt it as I was interviewing our guest today, Jim Butcher, but I'm just, again, kind of blown away as I'm recording this intro for the show because I've had many surreal moments on this show, many guests where I'm just like, how is this even happening right now? <laughs> they are so amazing to be setting aside time for the Story Punks podcast, and I just couldn't be more thrilled to be talking to these people. And a lot of the time, I'm completely, <laughs> I'm, I'm completely, I guess, fangirling and and a little bit just, it's surreal. That's the word, surreal. So definitely the case when it comes to Jim Butcher, I met Jim in an autograph line, so I'm sure he doesn't remember that, but he signed something for someone who means a lot to me. And and so after just his wonderful manner, I thought, well, he's a pretty amazing person. I'm going to definitely check out his steampunk book because in line, I heard about his steampunk book. So I I wasn't dialed in to his work at all, but just standing in line with his fans, I wanted to read his work and then knowing that this person I was standing in line for to get the autograph liked it, I uh, that was another reason to check out his work. But I was so blown away. So as you know, I always listen to audiobook versions, well for the most part. And so again, Audible is sponsoring this podcast and this episode of this podcast. So I was listening to the Ewan Morton reading and Ewan Morton is an actor. He does a fantastic job. I can absolutely recommend it. And I was listening to it and just totally reveling in these very cool characters. There's some feline stuff going on. There's so many cool friendships and Um, you know, opposing (laughs) dynamics. And it's just such a fun story. And then his world building is super cool as well. We're going to talk about all this, but if you have not yet jumped into the Cinder Spire series, I can absolutely recommend it. So as always, you can check out my running list of the the punk related audiobooks that I recommend at storypunks.world forward slash audible. But yeah, when I recorded this episode with Jim, he was not feeling well. And I just have to tell you, he still showed up and was so enthusiastic. He could have canceled, but that's just what his fans mean to him. And it really comes through. You cannot listen to this interview and not be impressed and endeared to this man. So (laughs) I am just so excited to share this with you. We go over tons of stuff and it is going to be a two-part series. So this is part one of two, as we do. You know what else it's going to be? It's going to be the finale of season one. I know I'm the one driving, but yeah, I didn't know this was going to be a show with seasons. (laughs) But I realized that this whole year has been building up to a finale like this. And so episode 30, which will be next episode, two-part series, remember, that is going to be such a wonderful high to end season one on. And during the break between season one and season two, I am going to be interviewing more people and just making sure I can stick to the bi-weekly schedule and getting a real head start so that I can make the most of every episode. And then the other thing I'll be doing is sharing who I'm interviewing with those who are signed up for the newsletter. That's just how I communicate. Hey, author X is coming on. Are you interested in submitting a question? It could be an audio question that I actually feature your voice on the show, or you could just type me something and I'll read it out. And it could be anonymous or I could give a shout out to you and your website, whatever. So please consider signing up at storypunks.world forward slash newsletter. And yeah, I don't have an official date for when I will be back. And so if you're subscribed through iTunes, just keep that going because you won't be getting new episodes until I give an announcement. And that's how you'll know, hey, the Story Punks podcast is starting up again. So also if you're on YouTube or any other channels, it should work about the same. And that way you can just be in the know. You can also sign up for that newsletter. 
So that will help you know what's coming up and what I'm doing. You can also go to cindygreg.com to learn about some of my other projects. So I am going to be producing other content that could inspire you, whether you're a writer or, you know, just working on creative projects in general and trying to be productive and trying to get stuff done. Uh, that's where you can find out other stuff I may be publishing throughout the break but of the show. And for example, there's my fiction. You can always check that out. So as you know well, if you've listened to other episodes of this show, I have a decopunk time travel thriller. So it's not just the 1920s, but my character goes to many other punked worlds in different time periods. And it's all about this conspiracy to control some salt sheen portals. So they're on the Earth's salt flats. Oh, it's a little Zelda Fitzgerald slash Amelia Earhart meets Lara Croft. And I am so excited to release Hives of the Halcyon. That's book one. And it's part of a larger series called The Salt Sheen Paradox. So book one starts in Bolivia. If you've ever been to Salar de Uni, that's where we're starting out. And uh, everything takes off from there. It's a pretty wild ride. So please check that out. Something for your deco punk or diesel punk fix. And then the other series that I just newly have put on pre-order is called Peacock Levine and the Ethereum Fates of Knot. So this is my Norse mythology super saga meets steampunk. And I hope you'll check it out. It has a different twist than most Norse mythology because it focuses on the women. So I have a lot of the main characters that we've seen like in Marvel's universe uh, tucked away conveniently. <laughs> So that we can really explore these women as they interact with our world. So it's urban fantasy. They come to like the Napoleonic War times and the apocalypse begins. <laughs> it also has plenty of like relationship stuff and adventure. And it truly is a super saga. It is a long story about the Valkyrie character and coming of age story. Kind of an ugly duckling story on steroids. So, yes, you can check out all my writing at cindygrig.com, C-I-N-D-Y-G-R-I-G-G.com. Ooh, a lot going on. I'm sure you relate. Whatever you have going on, I'm sure it's a lot. We've got the holidays coming. And even if things are just a little more chill right now, there's always more to do when we're doing all these creative projects and stuff. And so what do you say we stop, we break away, we listen to the wonderful insights of this very entertaining author, Jim Butcher. I think that sounds like the perfect thing to do this morning as I'm recording this. So here we go, part one of my interview with the wonderful Jim Butcher. Jim Butcher is the author of The Dresden Files, The Codex Alera, and a new steampunk series, The Cinder Spires, which has actually been out for a little bit. His resume includes a laundry list of skills, which were useful a couple of centuries ago. <laughs> and he plays guitar quite badly. An yes. avid gamer, he plays tabletop games in varying systems, a variety of video games on PC and console, and LARPs whenever he can make time for it. Jim currently resides mostly inside his own head, but his head can generally be found in his hometown of Independence, Missouri, excuse me. Jim goes by the moniker Longshot in a number of online locales. He came by this name in the early 1990s when he decided he would become a published author. Usually only three in 1,000 who make such an attempt actually manage to become published. Of those, only one in 10 make enough money to call it a living. The scale of a second series was the breakthrough that led, let him beat the long odds against attaining a career as a novelist. All the same, he refuses to change his nickname. So you can tell just from this bio alone how intriguing Jim is, and I just welcome you onto the show, Jim. Hey, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So on this show, we discuss the punks, and today we're focusing on steampunk, of course. Okay. So if you can just let me know your take on the term, how you define it, and what you feel qualifies as inbounds. Um, I, I'm, I'm less of a purist than most people as far as steampunk goes. Um, steampunk, um, when we're talking about steampunk, we're generally talking about uh, the future as as we would have liked it to have been. You know, the, it, it's an alternate view of the future from the past that 
uh, you know, from that viewpoint of the past seems reasonable, but which seems, you know, sort of ridiculous if you, if you try and play it out against actual real world rules, but because we're all a bunch of fantasy and science fiction nerds, we don't care about ridiculous. We just want to have cool airships. And, uh, uh, so when I'm writing, so, uh, and that's, that's kind of the heart of steampunk. And then it divides up into a bunch of different sub genres from there. Um, when I started writing the, the Cinder Spires, I, I kind of knew what I wanted to write because I was been very strongly inspired by uh, by nautical type, uh, Age of Sail type fiction, and uh, uh, so I knew I wanted to get that in there, and I wanted to get some steampunk stuff in there. Uh, uh, but um, you know, by the time I started putting my story together, I went to my editor. And I'm like, I'm not sure we can really call this steampunk. Can we market it as steam opera? She's like, you're not allowed to just make up your own genres, Jeff. You, you have are. to write something. You totally <laughs> no, can. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, you have to write something cool, and if enough people like it, then you can make up your own genre after that. It's fair, but it's like okay, you have to do a good story first. It's like fine, I'll work on it. You know, so <laughs> that's really see if I can if I can found a new genre. We'll see. <laughs> well, I I actually read about that term in relation to you, the steampunk opera thing. So, how do you feel like that differs from just a regular steampunk story? Um, a lot of the steampunk stories, uh, well, the, the, the main thing is, is that what I'm really writing is kind of a steam fantasy or, or steam fiction. I don't know. Uh, but a lot of steampunk stories uh, tend to be set very strongly within a legitimate historical locale that you've got to do a bunch of research on, which is, it, it's amazing to work with that, uh, to really kind of get in, get into a place and sort of dig it up and, and, and figure out how am I going to make my story work really well with this particular portion of history in this particular setting. Uh, uh, of course, the problem with that is, is then you have to figure out how am I going to make my story work with this particular portion of history in this particular setting. Uh, uh, it kind of makes it a whole lot more work for you in some ways. Um, and, and I didn't want to use uh, regular old earth because that seemed boring. Uh, uh, so I kind of set myself, I set things up in, in a slightly different world. We've got a lot of the, uh, the props and the accoutrement, I suppose, uh, of steampunk. But really, I'm kind of working on something that's more like a space fantasy. It's just we have to be using airships and stuff like that instead of spaceships. Beautiful. I love the term. I love the term. So I'm glad that <laughs> you brought you. that about. <laughs> okay, so book reviewer Adam Rowe describes the Aeronauts Windless, which is the first book in the Cinder Spire series. He describes it in terms of an equation. Quote, Horatio Hornblower plus sarcasm multiplied by steampunk raised to the power of sentient talking cat creatures. <laughs> so, Jim, is there anything about this equation you would change or add upon to describe this series? And can you summarize your other non-steampunk series for anyone that's not familiar with your work? Um, that seems reasonable to me. Uh, I mean, it's for, for, for a description, um, uh, the other two series I have are The Dresden Files, which is an urban fantasy series. My favorite description of that is Buffy the Vampire Slayer starring Philip Marlowe, uh, uh, which is my, that's my favorite description. Um, and then the other one is a, a fantasy series uh, uh, called the Codex Alera. And that one is essentially uh, a lost Roman Legion meets Pokemon. Uh, uh, so really, I mean, I, I don't mind breaking down the stories into a real, real simple, you know, kind of a formula and equation for it. Uh, Cause it, 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 yeah, that works. And that's really what I'm doing. I'm writing my dumb little wizard books and my little lost Roman Legion books and people just seem to tolerate them. So, uh, you know, I'm kind of having a good time doing it. And as long as I'm having fun and people are reading it or having fun, that's the important thing. Yeah. There seems to be a strong tolerance for it. <laughs> very popular. So far, so far, so far I've done, we've done all right. So, <laughs> but I'm very excited about the new series. I'm getting, I'm getting set to, I, I'm, uh, hopefully before the end of the year, I'll finish up the next Dresden book. Uh, and then I can get started on the next steampunk book, which is what I'm really looking forward to. Cause I get tired of that guy. Uh, uh, Harry Dresden is my big famous character, but boy, I get tired of hanging out with him. He's because he's like cool to read about in a book, but like imagine being his roommate, and then it's worse. And that's kind of closer to what I have. He's you know, in your I, head, yeah. He is, and I can't get rid of the guy, and I've got to come in and, and write his story. And and uh, and you know, I mean, if he actually knew me in real life, he would pop me right in the nose, which <laughs> he wouldn't even wait, just pow. And, and I'd be like, yeah, I had that coming. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, we want you to come back and write that other books in the steampunk series. So, oh, absolutely, we're behind uh, you. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the next one a lot. We'll get to do a lot more with like duels and society and stuff in the next one, and get to expand out into the world a little bit more and see what the other spires are like because each spire is so incredibly different uh, because it's such an isolated environment that that people grew up completely differently. Uh, uh, so it's. It's sort of like uh, when you could look at like uh, uh, medieval and Renaissance Europe, uh, you know, how, how 
uh, very separated each nation was from the other nations or each region was from the other regions. And so you had these extremely different cultures developing. Uh, uh, because of that, ge- that that isolation, and this is the same thing happening here. So I can make I can essentially make it just as insane as I want, and then justify it with oh they're developing a, an isolation. And people and anybody who like actually studies anthropology would be like, mm, yeah, that's a recipe for weird right there. Yeah, mm, I like it. Growing up, growing up by yourself, God knows what you're going to come up with. You know, so <laughs> well, no, that's so exciting. And as far as the the spires, for anyone that doesn't know, would you describe that as like a big tower? Um, it, it is. Well, I mean, it's 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 this enormous it's this enormous spire. The spire itself is it's, it's, it's an enormous tower. It's a cylinder uh, about two miles high and about two miles across, um, and then it's broken up into a bunch of levels as you go through. Uh, uh, you know, like kind of like a tiered cake, and uh, uh, each level you know has a, is essentially its its own little city. So you've got like 50 little cities that are all on top of one another and trying to deal with each other and, 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 and dealing with trade from this society that sort of broke down over time. Nobody even really remembers where the spires came from anymore. Uh, uh, but uh, I mean, I know, but that's all background stuff that only matters to me. Um, but uh, uh, but but yeah, I mean, it's and, and, and so society uh, sort of exists and, and the surface of their world is this extremely dangerous place. And, if you, and, and venturing out into it uh, to do things like like cut wood and gather things from the forest is essentially you walking into a war zone and, and has war zone level uh, uh, casualties. Uh, so all the all the travel that gets done and all the trade that gets done between the spires has to happen by airship. Uh, it's cause I really wanted airships to be like super important. So it's like, okay, we're going to, we're going to take, steal some Harry Harrison and, and, and play death world on the surface of this planet. Uh, it's just full of dangerous things that want to kill you. And, uh, uh, uh and, and so, you know, you've got to have these ships to go from place to place and to exchange, uh, trade and goods and culture. And of course, if you're doing that, then you're going to have pirates. And if you're going to have pirates, you're going to have people who defend against them. Once you have people to defend against them, then now you've got navies going back and forth and then you can have wars. Uh, uh so it was so much fun, like coming up with all this stuff. I mean, essentially, I sat down and said to myself, really, I just want to have a world where there's a really good reason to have goggles on all the time. You know, <laughs> and it's like, OK, well, let's set this world up to where there's actually bad things that happen to people if you don't wear your goggles. And so, you know, all the, all the aeronauts have got to have their goggles on or they'll they'll slowly go crazy over time. It's sort of like mercury poisoning. Well, uh, we hear you in this community, so we understand that. Oh, I know. Like, and plus, it sounds like, though. So go ahead. Sorry. The really, the really cheap thing is, is like, I'm designing characters going, you know what? I think I'd really like to cosplay this guy. I'm just going to make him look a little bit like me so I can go ahead and cosplay him later, you know, uh, or, or, or else designing characters that are like, you know, I really saw this, this cool uh, line of stuff that was coming out from this particular vendor that's at a bunch of conventions. I'm just going to go ahead and design a character that matches all that stuff. And then people have an easier time cosplaying it or, or coming up with somebody who's just like, yeah, okay, this particular over-the-top cosplayer, I know they're definitely going to want to play this character. So I'll just add in a few more things that I want to see that person wearing. <laughs> it's like, I, I feel like I'm using my author powers for evil at this point, you know, sort of manipulating things around me. But at the same time, I can't resist. So, you know, what are you going to do? Jim, you're using your powers for good design. And on that note, <laughs> you're really enjoying the background that you've got there. So, oh, that, well, this is this is my fiance's place here. So I was uh, going to say my guest... praise to your designer, whether it's you or someone <laughs> else. Well, it's 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 the guest room. It's it's kind of muddled. This is the clean part back here uh, for where the camera is. The rest of it's a mess. Yeah, uh, but it's it's the it's the guest room slash my writing office, which she gave unto me so that I could actually start getting books done again. Because uh, we're still waiting. I'm still waiting on on my my new place to be done. And it just isn't. It's. It's so hard living life without a base of operations. It's like, I need my evil lair. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I need my, my quiet solitude fortress to escape to. And I can just say, leave me alone, everyone, and work on my stuff. I've got to have that. Someone help me. <laughs> yeah, I know. Environment matters, but I think it this does, is a pretty good does. foil to whatever your evil lair must look like. I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's working out for the time being. It's a little, it's, the energy's a little girly in here for me, but, you know, uh, um, uh, I guess that's okay. You know, <laughs> you're handling it well. Okay, so yeah. like many, the cat-human hybrids were among my favorite characters. So they're known as the Warrior Born, and uh-huh. I was really curious about what the experience was like between writing these cat hybrid characters and your werewolf type or your wolf characters. Oh yeah, I mean, in other it series, to- so t- it was totally it was totally a tie-in. Um, 
uh, there's a lot of times where I, I, I'll write characters who I will build them in with some sort of connection to sort of their primal selves, or their more feral selves. Uh, so in, in the Codex Alera, in, in the Dresden Piles, I've got the werewolves. In the Codex Alera book, I had this race of barbarians called the Marat, who were also uh, uh, empaths with animals and would bond with, with you know, totem animals. And, and then they'd be riding around with their awesome animal, whatever it was. And, uh, uh, and here I'm using the warrior born, um, uh, which I mean, they sort of exist in a similar vein. They're not really the same thing, but, uh, but yeah, these poor guys, uh, they do, they've, they, they've, they've, they've been altered. They have the, they have the strength of lions in their blood is, is, is the way everybody there understands it. And, uh, uh, you know, they've, they've got this incredibly high metabolism. So they're just eating food all the time. They're also like super strong and stuff, but it also, it comes along with all this baggage of, 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 uh, of being totally connected to sort of your more primitive self. So you're much more likely to react uh, in a territorial kind of fashion as, as one of these people. You're much more likely to react in a physical fashion rather than using your words and your indoor voice. Uh, uh, and, and it's very difficult for these people to exist inside human society because uh, they're, under much, they're under many more pressures than people are. Uh, so they kind of tend to separate themselves and, and exist, you know, among others who understand. Um, uh, but at the same time, you know, there's some that 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 that, that try and, and fit in that to whom, you know, it's like, no, it's my family's important. I've got to fit in with them. And so that's sort of who one of our main characters is, is is poor Benedict, who's struggling to be a gentleman when when, you know, he's just been built to be an orc. And uh, 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 and so he you know, he's got that he's got that sort of dynamic tension going on in his character, which is so much fun. Uh, and plus just uh, and the, then, the feline superiority was pretty great. Well, yeah, I mean, it's. Well, I don't know if that's feline superiority as much as it is just kind of growing up, uh, you know, kind of in, in, in the situation that he did, uh, uh, because, you know, he's got this cousin who's, who's very much a child of privilege and very much a noble, not necessarily a terrible person, but that was where she grew up. And she's very used to being in command of things. And, uh, uh, she's got, she's got something of an ego. And so, and so for Benedict just kind of follows her around poking holes at it every once in a while. It's like, no, Gwen, you need to, you need to be a more reasonable human being. Let me let the air out a little. And, and so, and he's got that sort of that feline, uh, uh, point of view on a lot of things where he's just sort of that distant, distant, disinterested observer when it comes to humans, you know, so he can do stuff like that. Of course, he's not as bad off as the cats because, Oh my God, the cats are right. Or just such, if they were humans, they would be so horrible. Everybody would just want to slap them around, but they get away with it because they're cats and you know, they're cute. <laughs> So uh, th that's even worse. The, the cats and the cinder spires uh, are, are they're, they're, they're insentient beings. They're intelligent. Uh, and they've got like an opposable paw thumb on their hand too. So uh, uh, they live among humans and they're smart and they, they, they speak their own language uh, and they can understand uh, human language, except, you know, when they don't want to. And, uh, uh, <laughs> but they, you know, they, but they're these creatures that sort of exist in the, in the crawl spaces and the vents. And, you know, they hunt things and humans sort of tolerate them because they keep down the really bad vermin when the cats are there. Plus, you sort of have to respect them because they've got opposable thumbs and matches, you know. So it's it's like if a cat wants to show up in the middle of the night and burn your place down, he darn well can do it. So you've got to you sort of got to respect them. Uh, uh, so humans have generally worked out some boundary arrangements with cats. Uh, uh, and, and, and the very few humans actually uh, uh, actually have even more personal arrangements worked out with them. So, uh, you know, there, there's a few alliances with exceptional humans, but most humans are just a, wa a waste of time as far as cats are concerned. <laughs> it's so wonderful. So I hope this intrigues anyone who hasn't jumped into your series. It's just amazing. I love it. Uh, so, yeah, I, 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 I sold this series as Horatio Hornblower meets the X-Men. And... Uh, <laughs> It, I mean, I, I, wanted, works, I yeah. wanted to, yeah, I wanted to use League of Extraordinary Gentlemen because that would have been a little bit better, but that's really just Victorian X Men. Uh, so I decided to go with X Men because League didn't do so well, and I, I wanted to get the attention of the editor. So yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's, but it's, it's Hornblower meets the X Men, and they were like, ooh, so it's a little bit Star Trek. -y. I'm like, yeah, sort of a steampunk Star Trek. Think of it like that. They're like, okay, we can do that. And, and uh, so I uh, got, I, I managed to sell them on, on three books and, and we'll see if the fans continue to like it, then I'll, I'll keep writing it because I, I have so much fun writing it. So. Yeah. And I really enjoyed your narrator. So I listened to the audio version. Oh, he was so amazing, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I mean, all the, all, so the, all the different, all the different voices he could do. Yeah, he was stunning. 
So uh, they, they, they send me the short list and they say, okay, you can pick from, from these three because they don't want me to just pick from any random anyone on the entire planet because they're like, no, he's an author. He's going to pick someone weird. Uh, but the, they'll send me the short list here. Here's the list. I pick from these. And I, and I was kind of looked over that and listened to him and was like, oh my God, this, this man's amazing. Uh, it was like, yeah, him, 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 him. Uh, and they were like, okay, calm down. Jeez, Jim, relax. You know, it's like, sorry, I, I get a little nerdy about my stuff. Oh, totally. It must be amazing yeah. to hear such an accomplished voice actor read your stuff. It's, it was really and, wonderful. And I've been, well, and, and it, before I never really had too much of an opportunity to listen to the, my audio books. Um, but now, I mean, I've been driving back and forth between my home and independence and my, my fiance lives in Denver. And so I'm back and forth all the time. And, and you got to have something to listen to in a car driving six hours through Kansas, or you will, you will drive into a ditch just for the variety. Uh, uh so, so I, there's been a lot of audiobooks, and I've been able to like go back and listen to my stuff and be like, huh, I didn't even remember I wrote that or, or I, I, I didn't, or I didn't write it like that, but the way the line gets delivered will make me laugh. Uh, uh, or I'll stop and, and be like, oh my gosh, that drama was so good. Did I write that? Because that really came off amazing. I guess I must have. It didn't sound that way in my head when I wrote it, but when James Marsh just read it, it was amazing. You know, so uh, uh, that's kind of, it's it's weird when other people start playing with your stuff because I just, I just feel like I, I kind of want to lean over and say very quietly, you know, I just made all this up, right? It's not, it's not real. I just made it up. Uh, but but people keep you know saying no we want to play that we want to play with it too so you know there's the folks with the comic books are playing with it and the, the, the game folks are playing with it and 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 it's like okay good have a good time that was the idea uh, uh, but it still mystifies me that people will take this seriously um, really I thought I would just be one of those writers who sort of gets a, a book out for about a week and a half and then it goes away and the next year he comes back for it with another book that you know stays out for maybe two weeks. And Eddie feels good about that. I, I figured that would be my life uh, because I write about ridiculous things. But <laughs> no, uh, I, I think that just shows your humility. But it's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you say so. Yeah. Um, when it comes to scheduling all these projects, Jim, we've talked about this a little bit. But mm -hmm. how do you? Is your creative process to stagger them, kind of like what you're doing, or is that just a necessity? So. If, if I, if, if I, they get lumped together and I'm working on multiple, multiple projects at the same time, I, I tend to write the same story, like three different ways, you know? So at one point I was working on a Dresden book, a Spider-Man novel and an Alara novel all at the same time. Uh, and I didn't, I didn't plan it that way. It just sort of came down on my head that way. And I'm, I wasn't very good at managing my time. Um, so but, but what I found out was I, I realized as I was writing these scenes, it's like, oh, my gosh, I just wrote the scene for Alara and then I wrote it again for Dresden, but with different characters and, you know, different, a different paint job. And then I did it again in the Spider-Man book and it worked in each book. But at the same time, I'm sitting there going, I'm repeating myself. I've got to break this up. And uh, uh, so in the future, uh, you know, after I did that, I was like, no, no, we're going to do work on one book at a time. Uh, I'm, and I'm just going to indulge my OCD and, and we'll just do one thing at a time and get it, everything done in the proper order, uh, which works out better story-wise, uh, but which occasionally schedule-wise does not work out as well. If I get stuck in a spot, you know, it's, it's, I can't just leave, say, oh, I'm stuck on this story. Let me leap over to this other book and work on that one. So, you know, when I get stuck, I just have to keep pounding my head against the wall until I get through it. That sounds about right. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's how you have to do it sometimes. Okay, story punks, don't you just love how open and candid Jim is? There's so much more to learn from him coming up in the next segment. So the episode will conclude our conversation with Jim Butcher, and I'm so excited for that. So in the meantime, if you don't mind going to iTunes, please leave a review because it helps other people find the show, and I really appreciate it. So thank you in advance. And as ever, if you want to see what I've been working on, please head over to cindygrigg.com, C-I-N-D-Y-G-R-I-G-G.com, or theproductiveauthor.com. And I wish you luck with everything you're working on. Please take this inspiration that from Jim and just propel it towards your nearest work in progress. <laughs> I know he would love that, and I would love that, and the universe would love that. You have things to contribute, so please do. And have a wonderful couple weeks.